Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. As we carry out this interview, Kasatu, South Africa's largest trade union federation, has called for a national strike. Now, the strike is focusing on two issues. Firstly, Kasatu is calling for a ban on the practice of labor broking. And secondly, they are uh, protesting against government's proposed measures to impose a toll on Gauteng Province's roads. Um, our discussion today, however, is not going to focus on the toll system. It will focus on labor broking in South Africa. With us in the studio today is our guest Ihsan Schroeder. Ihsan is the coordinator of the Casual Workers Advice Office. Welcome to the studio, Ihsan. Ihsan, tell us, why is Kosatu having this uh, protest action against labor broking today? Well, labor broking is a very new development in South Africa's labor history. The, uh, over the last, what, 15 years or so, uh, 20 years maybe, we've seen the emergence of a new relationship on the factory floor, which is a, what is often referred to as a triangular relationship, a three-way relationship in the employment relationship, which is a very new development, as I say. If you take, say, just as an example, South African breweries that might employ uh, 50 of these labor broker workers, they are involved in the process of production in the way that other workers are. They uh, are, as I say, their working hours are determined by South African breweries. The South African breweries, supervisors, foremen, etc., can discipline these workers. And yet these workers are not employed by South African breweries. They might be supplied by a particular labor broking firm with whom South African, labor, South African breweries then has a contract to supply this, this labor. The, the workers are paid by the labor broking firm, but yet all the power to determine their, their daily work lies with SAB. The advantage for SAB is that if it decides it no longer wants 50 workers, it only wants 30 workers, it simply informs the labor broker that it no longer requires 50 workers, it requires 30 workers. Now that allows it to circumvent the, the, uh, the provisions of the Labor Relations Act that would normally obtain in relation to uh, retrenchment of workers, reduction of staff, for example. The onus then falls back on the labor broking firm to deal with the 20 excess workers. And typically what happens, the labor broking firm will say to the workers, well, the client company has uh, ended the contract with us, you no longer have any work. That's of course completely illegal. But the workers have the understanding, unfortunately, that they think they contract workers. And the company, the labor broking firm, has the right to simply tell them to, to go. Um, so the workers are losing the protection of the labor law that they would otherwise have had if they were employed directly by SAB. But there's a second component. Because the workers are supplied by the labor broker, they often can earn far less than other workers on the SAB factory floor doing the same work but they earn far, these labor broker workers will earn far less. So there's a further incentive for both the labor broker and for SAB to have these workers on the factory floor because they undercut the other workers, they earn much less, although they do exactly the same work. Can you tell me how prevalent, uh, prevalent the practice of labor broking is in South Africa? Well, uh, as I said earlier, there's, you know, it's over the last sort of 15, 20 years, this thing has literally just exploded. In terms of numbers, um, a company that's one of the big labor broking firms, uh, Atcor, they estimate that there are something like just under a million workers, labor broker workers, covered by just bargaining councils alone. Now, that's a very significant statistic because bargaining councils as a whole cover only something like, estimated something like an 11% of the total workforce in the country. Now, if you have just under a million workers in just under bargaining councils, it suggests that we could have anything between two, up to something like two million workers working as labor broker workers. That's Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the impact on the quality of lives of these workers in terms of what are the wider implications in their lives of working uh, for labor broking companies? I mean, I'm given to understand that many of them don't really understand that they're working uh, not for companies but for brokers um, and this means that they can be shifted around uh, when and as they are needed in different workplace environments. Um, what are the, the, how does this impact their lives? Yeah. Look for starters, I mean the, uh, you know, as you say, the, 
you know, the workers often don't even know who the employer is. Now, this is a, a dramatically new development. You know. uh, at the CCMA, something like 30% of workers who come there don't even know who their employer is. You know, we have it all the time. Workers walk in there, they say, so and this company has dismissed me, and we say, can we see your payslip? And it turns out that's actually not their employer. The worker wasn't even aware of that. So the worker doesn't often know who the employer is. The significance of that is that the worker doesn't know where to turn if they have a labor problem. You know, if they have an issue, a dispute or whatever, they don't know who to take it up with, for starters. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, often these workers will do work done by permanence at a far lower rate of pay. I mean, we've come across examples where the worker gets dismissed by the, by the client company, sends the worker, the client company sends the worker on to the labor broker to go and sign up with the labor broker. The worker comes back into the factory floor to perform exactly the same job that they did before for less than half the wage than they earned before. That's fairly, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, that might not be the typical experience of every single labor broker worker, but certainly the incentive to use labor broker workers is that, one incentive is that it's cheap to use labor broker workers. So the level of wages tends to be very low. That's a, a problem. The workers have, there's a, you know, this idea of labor broking work is based on the notion that these workers signed fixed term contracts, most of them. I mean, that our experience is most of these workers don't have, they don't see the contract. Uh, some of the funny examples the workers will give you is that the employer puts his or her arm over the contract and they make the worker sign at the bottom. Again, that's probably not typical, but these are the kind of anecdotes we get from workers. But certainly what is uh, not anecdotal is that very few of these workers have copies of their, agreement, of, their, of their contracts. The employers have a practice where they will sign the, you know, the starting date of the contract. So they'll say the contract starts on the 15th of January. The contract is supposed to have a closing date. They leave it blank. And then when they want to get rid of the worker, they simply say to the worker, uh, your contract is finished. And they quite fraudul fraudulently will fill in the date by which the, the worker supposedly have ended, has, has ended the contract. So there's a lot of that kind of practice. It means effectively that these workers have no job security. That's effectively what it means. Um, they often employed on conditions that are, you know, they have no benefits, like, uh, you know, provident fund or medical aid or any of those kind of conditions. So they literally just work for a wage that is generally very, very low. Can you tell me if you think uh, Cosatu's call for a ban on labor broking is an appropriate response to meet the needs of workers, the changing needs of workers. Yeah. Look, I think there are at least three problems with this call for a ban on labor broking. I think we all support putting an end to this practice of labor broking. But the call for a ban is problematic for a number of reasons. The first one is that the the ANC, central to the ANC's policy with regard to workers and their rights and the institutions through which they struggle for increased rights or accessing their rights, what is generally referred to as the labor market, the ANC's labor market policy. Central to that policy is the question of labor flexibility. Uh, this is stated clearly in the GEAR document, it's stated clearly in the Green Paper on Labor that came out in 1996. It sees labor flexibility, in other words, the ability of bosses to exploit workers more readily and more efficiently. It sees that as central to South Africa's economic growth. And it's not an accident. I mean, I keep mentioning, you know, labor broking exploding over the last 15, 20 years. People like Jan Teron down at the University of Cape Town have actually done research into labor broking and sort of charting its growth, as it were. And there's a direct correlation between when labor broking just grows exponentially, it goes through the roof in the period 95, 96, 1995, 1996. And that's exactly the time at which the ANC introduces its new labor laws. So this question of flexible labor and labor broking as one of its forms is central to the ANC's labor market policy. The ANC, therefore, for that reason, is not just going to ban it. You're going to need mass mobilization and strong organization to oblige the ANC to change that policy. But I think that's the second problem with Casato's call for a ban. Casato has made no effort to organize these workers. Uh, a survey done on Casato's membership a couple of years ago revealed that 92% of its members are permanent workers. 
And this is what we experience all the time. The workers who come to us, they're in factories organized by Kasatu. Kasatu is not interested in organizing these labor broker workers. And for me, the answer lies not just in calling a ban on these workers. The answer lies in beginning to organize them. Some of the Kasatu people we've spoken to, when you say, why is Kasatu not organizing these workers? They say, no, if we organize the workers, it legitimates the, pro the, the, the practice. Which is a bizarre argument to have, because if you extend the logic of that argument, Kasatu shouldn't be organizing any workers at all, because by organizing workers, they're legitimating the capitalist system. So it's a very strange argument that I don't really understand. The third problem, of course, is that if you simply ban these labor workers, what happens to these workers who are already in employ, in the employ of these labor brokers? And as I say, there are no reliable stats, but if you take a figure, you know, a ballpark figure of about two million workers, what happens to these workers? Should they just lose their jobs? Does that matter to Kasatu that these workers might just lose their jobs? So I think it's a highly problematic response to just call for a ban. I think the central task is to actually organize those workers into organization and then struggle over time. Firstly, to make these workers permanent, to get the, comp the client companies that employ them to make them permanent. Secondly, um, we can then struggle around changes in legislation, changes in institutions through which these workers can be protected, etc., etc. But to simply call for a ban, I think reveals an hostility to the workers and not just an hostility to the practice. You know, and I think that's what lies underneath this call for banning them and not being indifferent to what would happen to those workers if, they were to, if the practice were to be banned. I want to ask you a question about people that are not in formal employment. How do institutions like Kasatu respond to the needs of workers in the informal sectors of the economy? Well, the answer is simple. They haven't responded. Um, and it's consistent with the point I was just making. I don't think Kasatu is interested in organizing these other kind of you know, the non-permanents, whether they be in the formal economy, which a lot of them are, or these, uh, you know, the kind of uh, fruit sellers on the street corners, uh, etc. You know. And for me, that's consistent with Casado's history. I mean, if you look at the difficult sectors, like domestic work, if you look at uh, farm workers, for example, if you look at construction work, um, Casado over time has just completely failed to organize those workers consistently. Uh, so that's its history, and the inability to organize these other workers is consistent with that history. It is much easier to organize the white-collar workers, it is much easier to sign your agency shop agreements and you get the monthly uh, stop orders. That's easy, you don't have to leave the office, you simply sit in the office. So what's the way forward to ensure that, by and large, uh, in the most broadest sense, that all workers in South Africa, particularly those working uh, on the lowest rungs of our economy, get protection? Look, the way for the last probably 100 years, the way that trade unions have organized themselves is that they follow a specific industry. So you start a union for chemical workers, and all workers in the chemical industry then join your union. If, you, know, you don't organize workers who might belong to the metal industry or the transport sector. You organize only the chemical workers. What's happened over the last... 30 years is that the capitalist system has very fundamentally reorganized the workplace. So workers like these labor broker workers, workers like casual workers, they don't hop companies within an industry like the permanents tend to do. They hop whole industries. So they might work in the chemical industry, say, for three months or six months, possibly even a year. It varies quite widely. Then they might end up working in the, in the metal industry for, say, three months, six months. And after that, the labor broker sends them, then they work maybe in the transport sector. Or if you're a casual worker, you hop industries all the time. So I think it's, it's clear that the industrial union model can't work for these new kinds of workers. The, the growing number of casual workers, this large number of labor broker workers, you can't use the industrial model to organize these workers. And which is why lots of organizations have started talking about new forms of organizing. So it's clear we need to find a form of organization that takes into account the fact that these workers hop industries, that takes into account that maybe for part of the year these workers are actually not even working. How do these workers subsist in the time when they're not working? Surely the organization that attempts to organize them must also take that reality into account. They might be living in a squatter camp, which invariably workers of this kind do. <coughs> 
what does the organization then say about their living conditions, the social wage, access to health care, etc., etc. That, that's where the answer lies. But it's clear that you're going to have to take into account the full experience of these workers and not just you know, the industrial experience, the workplace experience. As I say, the question, for example, of what happens to these workers at the time of the year when they're not working? What do you do then? The unions have a policy that if you lose your job after three months, you're no longer a union member. Now, that clearly won't apply. You can't use that model in, in, a, in an organization where you know for a fact that there might be a large part of the year when your members are not actually working. You know, you're just going to have a revolving door, that you're going to have new members all the time. But I think that there's a more fundamental question here for me, which is, you know, is the industrial model even still appropriate for the industrial workers themselves? And there I have a strong sense that it's no longer the case. You know, the industrial model is not even delivering to its own industrial members. The permanent worker, you know, who's working in an industry, has been there for 20 years, or maybe be there for another 10. These industrial unions don't even seem to be delivering for those workers. And I'm not surprised. It can't be otherwise. As I say, you know, these organizations are about 100 years old. And capitalism has changed so dramatically in the last 30 years that I think it's, it's obvious that the forms of organizations like the industrial union, the institutions that characterize that whole preceding period of capitalist development when the industrial unions emerged, the institutions like your bargaining councils, for example, <coughs> I think they've outlived their usefulness. They've become weapons against workers now, whereas at some point, maybe in the mid-80s, early to mid-80s, they might have been weapons in the hands of workers. These industrial, these bargaining councils, as they now called, they've become weapons in the hands of the employers. And I would go so far as even to say that some of these industrial unions themselves, including major Kasatu affiliates, have become weapons in the hands of the employers. So if the industrial model of trade unions is finished in your words, what does the future hold for an organization like Kusatu, for example? Look, I don't want to be a sort of crystal ball gazer, but I mean, I think it's a question of time before it disappears. 10 years, 15 years, and maybe it, it should disappear sooner rather than later. Because I think organizations like Kusatu prevent workers from seeing the need to begin to forge new weapons and to find new institutions through which to mediate the struggle with the bosses on the factory floor on a daily basis. So I don't think it's, it's as I say, you know, I don't want to be a stargazer, but it's a question of time. I, I'd be surprised if Kusatu is still here in 15 years' time. 10 years and it'll be gone. Thank you very much, Ihsan, for joining us. Sure. And thank you for joining us at Saxis. Mm -hmm.